Pastor Tim, so I thought I would do that again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, good. Just making sure we're all awake for you here. Um, it is good to be back, and it's good to uh, be back up here. I'm sure you all hear that more than once, but it's funny the things you forget. You know, I was sitting there visiting, and I hadn't even checked to make sure that the words were there, and then I grabbed the wrong mask, and you know, it's very important to have the right mask. I found one today that's stiff enough. I don't have to stick my finger under it. So these things are very important. It becomes important. So I'm glad to be here with you. I'm glad to have some laughter. I'm glad to um, celebrate and worship with everyone this morning. So would you all stand if you were able with me? And let's, um, let's open with a word of prayer this morning. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you for the joy that it is to stand before you today as, as your children your congregation here in Rhineland and even from other parts of the world as we have visitors today and just are so grateful that we can come together as family. Thank you for the opportunities that we have and for the new gratefulness I think that we have to be able to share them together. I pray Lord that, <clears throat> that your spirit would be just working in our hearts today, opening our and our minds to understand and know you better today and just um, to be able to worship just in spirit and in truth and to, to love you all the more for doing so. So I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name.
Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. And again, I want to extend you a welcome here. It's good to see you all again here uh, this morning as we just come to spend time uh, worshiping the Lord this morning. Um, but I'll invite you to turn to Esther 9. I think you guys are catching on here that we're in Esther. You know, we're in our second and last sermon on Esther. So I'll just direct you towards that. Now, I can't imagine anything much worse than the anticipation for war. I assume that this is something that none of us have ever had to anticipate being a part of, but perhaps some of you are old enough to remember, you know, World War II, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, and many other conflicts, but for the most part, I'm assuming that none of us has had to anticipate going to war. Now, while I was getting ready to preach this week, I started looking up times in history when countries were getting ready to go to war. As I was doing this, I came across letters that Benjamin Franklin had written to his friends and colleagues in 1775 before the start of the Revolutionary War when America sought its independence from Great Britain. It was interesting to read how he wrote to his friends both in America and in England. He spoke of all the preparations that the Americans were making between his friends in the States. He spoke of the walls that were being built in the harbors and the men who were being counted for war. And then to his English friends he wrote, I guess we're enemies now. I guess we no longer can be friends during this time of war. Our principles have divided us. And this was all in anticipation of what was about to happen in the war between America and Britain. Now, it would be hard to imagine anticipating a war like this and telling your friend or your neighbor what you were doing to prepare for it. You know, if Alberta and Saskatchewan were for some reason to go to war, I can't imagine calling my parents and my friends back home to tell them uh, what I was doing to prepare for war and that we were now enemies. You know, I can't imagine coming to the understanding that they were now my enemy. In fact, you know, I just can't imagine even fighting back against the land where I grew up in. So it left me thinking, you know, how would I be at, uh, doing if I had to anticipate something like this? You know, what, what would I be doing if I had to anticipate going to war? It was a challenging thing for me to think about. Now, the people that we'll be looking at in our passage today had, had something like that to anticipate. You know, in the passage that we're going to look at this morning, we're going to see the result of eight months of anticipation to a day of war between the Jews and those who hated them. We're going to see the pouring out of hatred toward the Jews, but also we're going to take time to recognize that God was with his people in the battle as they defended themselves against those who hated them. By the end of this passage, I hope that we'll be able to come to understand how God has and does fight alongside his people. In life, we face all sorts of hate. There's hate between family members, there's hate between co-workers, there's hate between neighbors, and there's a clear hate for Jesus and his church throughout history. And this hate is all fueled by the enemy, by Satan himself. And so this morning, we're going to acknowledge that we are in a battle each day against this hatred and evil. But we're also going to take time to see how God has already won that battle through Jesus Christ against the evil of sin and his great consequence of death. And we're all going to see this as we work through this story of Esther 9. Now there's a war between God and evil. But God already has the victory through Christ's first coming. But he will also display this victory when Jesus comes again. And once Jesus has displayed the victory... There will be rest and there will be relief for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. We're going to also see that at the end of this chapter that there was also great rest and relief for the, um, the Jews as God worked on their behalf and fought alongside them. So if you haven't already turned there, please turn with me to Esther 9 uh, verses 1 through 19 as we look at the example of God's people in Persia as they defend themselves against the great people that has been planned against them. So turn with me to Esther chapter 9, and I will be reading that for us this morning as we get started. 
So Esther chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. The king's command and law went into effect on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month Adar. On the day when the Jews' enemies had hoped to overpower them, just the opposite happened. The Jews overpowered those who hated them. In each of King Ahasuerus' provinces, the Jews assembled in their cities to attack those who intended to harm them. Not a single person could withstand them. Fear of them fell on every nationality. All the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the royal civil administrators uh, aided the Jews because they feared Mordecai. For Mordecai exercised great power in the palace, and his fame spread throughout the province as he became more and more powerful. The Jews put all their enemies to the sword, killing and destroying them. They did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the fortress of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, including Harshandatha, Dalphan, Ashtatha, Horatha, Adalai, Eridatha, Harmashta, Erzai, Erida, and Vasatha. They killed these ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. However, they did not seize any plunder. On that day, the number of people killed in the fortress of Susa was reported to the king. The king said to Queen Esther, In the fortress of Susa, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men, including Haman's ten sons. What have they done in the rest of the royal provinces? Whatever you ask will be given to you. Whatever you seek will also be done. Esther answered, If it pleases the king, may the Jews who are in Susa also have tomorrow to carry out today's law. And may the bodies of Haman's ten sons be hung on the gallows. The king gave the orders for this to be done. So a law was announced in Susa, and they hung the bodies of Haman's ten sons. The Jews in Susa assembled again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed 300 men in Susa, but they did not seize any plunder. The rest of the Jews in the royal provinces assembled, defending themselves and gained relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of those who hated them, and they did not seize any plunder. They fought on the 13th day of the month of Adar and rested on the 14th, and it became a day of feasting and rejoicing. But the Jews in Susa had assembled on the 13th and the 14th days of the month. They rested on the 15th day of the month, and it became a day of feasting and rejoicing. This explains why the rural Jews who live in villages observe the 14th day of the month of Adar as a time of rejoicing and feasting. It is a holiday when they send gifts to one another. So, quite the passage, lots of war and lots of killing going back and forth there. But as we come to this passage, we find ourselves jumping right into Haman's day. This is a day in which Haman planned to annihilate the Jews who lived throughout the entire empire of Persia. But it's also a day that he would never see. Since Haman's death back in chapter 7, Mordecai the Jew was appointed to second in command of the whole Persian empire and was now a respected and feared individual among the Persians. And last week, while Pastor Tim was preaching, we learned in chapter 8 that Mordecai wrote a decree that now gave the Jews the ability to defend themselves against the anticipated attack of those who hated them. Within the decree, they were allowed to do whatever pleased them in their defense and to take spoil of those who sought their destruction. Those allowances will be important to remember later, but for now, the Jews were able to prepare themselves for what would come eight months later on the 13th day of Adar. This was good news for the Jews throughout the empire. It meant that they could defend themselves. A nerve, as nerve-wracking as that would be, they were no longer just sitting ducks. It also meant that they now had their own ally Mordecai in the king's court, who would look out for their well-being. Now, if we look at the end of chapter 8, at verse 17, we see that this was not uh, for, or we see that this was a cause for great fear among the people of Persia, that, that this Mordecai guy was now the second in command. This was great fear for them in this new law. 
This new decree caused many people throughout the empire to call themselves Jews just so that they might come up favorably on this 13th day of Adar. The sudden rise of a Jew to the second highest position in the empire would have been an intimidating thing to those who had seen and experienced the treachery of Mordecai's predecessor, Haman. And I'm sure many thought that Mordecai would be justified to carry out wrath on the people, uh, on the people in response to Haman's hostility toward him and the Jews. I'm sure many were certain that maybe this Mordecai guy would respond to what Haman had done and had said about the Jews. And so fear of the Jews was a way in which many Persians anticipated the 13th day of Adar. They feared what would happen if they now crossed their new leader. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever experienced a change in bosses. I know I never have had to really experience that, but based on my own thoughts, you know, I wouldn't want to push my luck too much with a new leader. You know, there's, there's a good reason to be cautious and to be on the good side of your new boss, your commander, your leader, or whatever uh, you would call them. And this is what we see a bit of in verses 3 and 4. Now, I know I'm skipping over a bit here, and I will come back to verse 1 and 2, but here in verse 3 and 4, we see that all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the royal civil administrators aided, I didn't say hated, aided the Jews because they feared Mordecai. Now, first, if you do not read this passage carefully, it might cause you to think that Mordecai was a bit of a bully. We're not told if that's the case, and from what we know of him, this never seems to really line up with his character. You know, if we are looking back in the book of Esther, we see, you know, he, this kind man who took care of his cousin, and this man who was willing to warn King Ahasuerus against the plot that was against his life. And so, to think of Mordecai as being a bull, he doesn't seem to line up much with his character. You know, Mordecai was not feared because he was a bully, but in fact, if we look to verse 4, uh, he was feared because he exercised great power in the palace. He had great power that brought with it great authority. He was someone whose position demanded respect, even a healthy amount of fear. For example, you know, you take the police, and now I know there's a lot of different views out there these days on police. But because of the authority they have and the position they have to exercise the law, there's a little bit of fear that seems to rush over oneself when you know you've just sped by a cop and you've been pulled over. <laughs> if you're like me at least, when you get pulled over by the cop, there's a bit of a healthy fear because you know you, you respect the position and you know um, that they have the authority to write a ticket out to you or not. And so I don't fear them just because of fear's sake, but I fear them more just out of respect because I know they have a little bit of control and authority in what's about to happen in my life. So the fear of many Persians in this story was driven by the respect that they had for Mordecai and his new position. He had the power to retaliate against all the wrong that Haman had designed for him, but he restrained himself and only made a decree that enabled the Jews to defend themselves from those who wished evil on them. And so fear was how some individuals anticipated this day. But on the other hand, uh, you have those who anticipated it with hate. Now just because Haman was gone did not mean that a hate for the Jews went with it. Just because he was gone did not mean that a hate for the Jews went with it. Haman may have been the par excellence hater of the Jews, but the spirit of hatred was still active in thousands of people, as was demonstrated in their attack on the Jews. Eight months of stewed up hatred allowed the Persians to really plan out their attack. They knew who they were going to target and whose wealth they were going to plunder. You know, they'd already decided whose couch they were going to take. There was a lot of time for the Persians to come up with a successful plan to raid and pillage the Jews, fueled by their hatred as they anticipated this day that was approaching. Now imagine having eight months to let your hatred for someone fester. You know, I can't imagine how bitter these people must have thought. 
I would be sick. I'd be sick if I had, was hating someone for that long. And it's this kind of hate that makes me believe that there has to be more behind this hate than just a grudge or people living in your land. A hate, I think, that's fueled by evil intent and let alone by the evil one himself. And not just a hate for God's people, but a hate for God himself. A hate for God himself. It wasn't just a hate for the people, but a hate for God himself. And it was in this bitter hate that we see the Persian people attack the Jews. And boy, were they in for a surprise on the 13th day of the God. And on this day, a whole out holy war broke out. Now in verse 1, we can read that the Jews' enemies had hoped to overpower them. But just the opposite happened. In verse 2, we read that the Jews assembled in their cities to attack against those who intended to harm them. But not a single person could withstand the Jews. There was no one who could match the defense of the Jews, and fear of the Jews fell on every nationality in Persia. No one could overpower the Jews. Now one would think that there would be maybe some sort of storied struggle that happened here, but that was not the case. No one could overcome the Jews. The Jews had great success on this 13th day of Adar. And this looks like the work of God. This looks like the work of God. I can't think of a war or a battle where only one side experiences all the casualties other than a battle where God gets involved. Now, nowhere in this passage do we read that God was with the Jews or that he was fighting for them, but we can get a real sense that God was by the success that they had. Even though God's name is not mentioned once in this book, in this part of the story of Esther, we're seeing God give victory to his people in a very quiet way. Now, if God's will had been for the Jews to be annihilated, that's probably what we would read in this story. But that's not what we read. We read of great victory and power over their enemies. It was a battle that fulfilled the will God had for his people, the Jews, at this time. Now in verses 5 to 9, we read that the Jews put all their enemies to the sword, killing and destroying them. They did what they pleased to those who hated them. And in the fortress... Of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, which included all the sons of Haman, the sons that Haman had once gloated about to all his friends. Now, 500 men's destruction in the fortress of Susa is a big deal. You know, the fortress was home to many in the palace guard. These were well-trained men who, were, who appeared to still be loyal to Haman and their hate of the Jews. But amazingly, uh, even in this situation, the Jewish public was able to defend themselves from these very well-trained and powerful men. Somehow these public Jews were able to defend themselves against these very well-trained and powerful men. Now we'll come back to the sons of Haman later, but what is apparent is that great success had been given to the Jews as they fought back. Now notice at the end of verse 10, it says, however, these Jews, they did not seize any plunder. They had great success, but they did not seize any of the plunder. They didn't take what was there for them to take. The Jews did not seek any of their enemies' wealth. It was there for the taking, but they did not grab it. And this, too, is an important detail that we'll come back to later on as we make some connections to other Bible passages. Now, this number of 500 men was reported back to King Ahasuerus, who reported to Esther the same information that 500 men had been killed in the fortress of Susa, including Haman's ten sons. Now in this interaction, we're not told what King Ahasuerus' reaction is. You know, one would think that you might see a bit of a concern for his citizens, but we don't, we don't see this. We don't see him concerned. And we can't really be too sure how Ahasuerus is actually feeling in this situation. You know, has he grown to fear the Jews and their God? Has he done that? Or is he still the drunk king that we've seen repeatedly in this book? It's hard to know. But anyway, whether it was out of fear of the Jews or whether it was out of a lack of care for his citizens, Ahasuerus went on to offer Esther yet again whatever she wanted. 
He did not yet know how things were shaking down in the provinces of the empire. But he offered again to Esther whatever she desired in her interaction with, with the king. Now Esther's answer might surprise you. And in fact, I think it makes most modern readers very uncomfortable. But in verse 13, she asks, If it pleases the king, may the Jews who are in Susa also have tomorrow to carry out uh, today's law. And may the bodies of Haman's ten sons be hung on the gallows. So let that sink in. As modern readers, this makes us feel pretty uncomfortable. We hate to think of the hero Esther as being bloodthirsty and ruthless. You know, we, we hate to think of her that way. And if we don't know the details beyond the story, you know, we might be left thinking that she is a bloodthirsty tyrant. But I want to assure you uh, here and tell you that I don't think she is. She's not some horrible Haman, but is being used by God to accomplish his purpose of divine judgment on his enemies. God is using Esther to carry out the divine judgment that is due wickedness. The war that the Jews were involved in on this day was not merely a political war, but was a sacred war, a holy war, and it is, and we'll see that in the details as we move forward, looking at other uh, biblical passages. Now, as we move on in verses, or we're moving on into verses 14 and 16. The Jews continued to defend themselves a second day in Susa, killing those who hated them, but also resisting to seize the plunder. These are important details to understand as we now look at other biblical details. But in total, an additional 300 men in Susa were killed, and in the provinces of the empire, there were 75,000 men that were killed. Now that's a lot of bloodshed. Now keep in mind, that the area this happened in reached from modern day Egypt as far as India. You know, we're talking about an exceptionally large area. Almost all of the Middle East was covered in this day of destruction. So there was a lot of spread out destruction. Now I know it doesn't make the reality of it any easier to digest, but the biblical details hopefully will. There's other biblical passages that we're going to look at now. So as I said before, um, this was not just a political conflict, but this was a spiritual war of divine judgment. Now throughout scripture, there have been many conflicts that have shared similar details uh, as this story. There's been different biblical stories that share similar details to this. And so to give us a little better idea of what's happening here, we're going to take some time to work through other scriptural passages just to understand this maybe a little clearer. In Genesis 14, Abram went to war to rescue his nephew Lot. And when he came home in triumph, the king of Sodom wanted to reward Abram. Now, Sodom was the hometown of Lot. But Abram refused to receive any reward from the king of Sodom, lest wicked Sodom be said to be the source of his prosperity. God had promised to bless Abram, and wicked Sodom was not to be the source of his blessing. Now, Abram did not seek his wealth from the world, but from the God who was with him, and who had promised to bless him, and who was in the battle with him. And so from that point on, when God's people went to war, they were never to plunder their enemy unless God commanded them or gave them permission to do so. God was to be the source of his people's blessing, not the wealth of the wicked. And of course, we see in this story here, the Jews did not go on to plunder their enemies. Like you would think they might. You know, I would, you know, if I were to go to war against my enemy, I likely would be someone that would want to go and take my neighbor's couch. I don't know, something like that. Something ridiculous like that. But this was um, right from the beginning here when Abram went um, out to... To help out his, uh, his nephew, um, he, he did not take any of the wealth or the blessing that was offered him, lest he become uh, blessed through things that were wicked. Now, if we fast forward to the book of Joshua, uh, to the conquest of the promised land, as the Israelites entered the land and fought their enemies, they were instructed not to plunder their enemies, 
Not to take their wealth, not to take their couch, not to take their car, not to take their, their you know, objects or their things that they had. But they were instructed not to plunder them, but to destroy everything that was wicked and devoted to wickedness by the Canaanites. This was an instruction that God had given them. Now, there were some very fatal consequences if one were to take the plunder for themselves. In Joshua 7 and 8, as the Israelites battled against Ai, um, after defeating Jericho, they found themselves continually losing to Ai. This seemed to contradict the promise that God would give them the land so easily. Right? But a man named Achan had taken plunder in an earlier battle. Once the, falls had, or once the walls had fallen at Jericho, Achan had taken some of the plunder for himself that was meant to be given to the Lord. As a result, his punishment was death. He had been instructed in obedience, but he chose to be disobedient in sin. And as a result, he experienced the wages of sin, which is death. And so taking plunder was not for the people, it was to be devoted to destruction or was to be given to God. And so the people of Israel were to exact God's divine judgment on immorality and idolatry. They were by no means supposed to profit from the wickedness of the immorality and idolatry while being an instrument of God's judgment. So they weren't supposed to profit from this wickedness that God had devoted to destruction. Now this principle of not plundering, but devoting to destruction the wicked continued on in the conquest of the land and into the history and role that Israel itself played as one of God's tools for divine judgment. Now you may recall that the story of Esther has an interesting way of pointing us back to the history and failure of Israel to fulfill God's divine judgment. If you turn back to Esther chapter 3, you'll read that Haman was an Agagite. He was the descendant of King Agag, he, who was also king of the Amalekites. Now if you remember back the last summer's sermon series, we actually took some time to look at King Agag a very little bit. Pastor Tim preached on King Saul, but within the story of King Saul, we talked about Saul's failure to deal with King Agag and the Amalekites. Now the story that I'm talking about happens in 1 Samuel 15. In this chapter, God commands Saul and the Israelites to go and to destroy everything of the Amalekites. The Amalekites had been vicious and hostile to the Israelites as they left Egypt. And now, during the reign of Saul, the time to judge the Amalekites for what they had done to Israel had come. Nothing of the Amalekites was supposed to be left over and nothing was supposed to be taken as plunder. Nothing from the, or nothing from the uh, wicked Amalekites was supposed to remain. No gathering of their wealth was allowed. It was the Lord's command and His desire for the Israelites to be obedient in this. Unfortunately, the Israelites disobeyed God. Saw their king disobey God. And they took for themselves all the sheep, goats, donkeys, and even the king of the Amalekites, Agag himself. Saul and his men did not destroy what God had commanded them to, but instead intended to sacrifice these animals to the Lord. But God did not want sacrifices from Saul, but desired his obedience. Saul disobeyed, and there were consequences. Saul was rejected as king, and the kingdom of Israel was torn from him. And the wickedness of the Amalekites was supposed to come under utter destruction, but this did not happen. And according to the book of Esther, clearly the descendants of Agag lived on and were now represented by Haman and his sons. And this brings us back to the 13th day of Adar and Esther. On this day, we see a bit of a throwback to the day that Saul and his army were supposed to go out and defeat the Amalekites. In chapter 9, we see God's judgment of the wicked descendants of Agag on full display. In chapter 9 of Esther, we see the Jews accomplishing what God had desired for the Israelites and Saul to do in 1 Samuel 15, to completely 
destroy what was wicked and to take nothing that was devoted for destruction, lest they profit from the wickedness of those who hear them. Now after one day of great bloodshed, we read that Esther asked for a second day of battle and to hang the sons of Haman on the gallows. Now again, this makes us feel uncomfortable today as people because we think we're beyond this kind of violence as humans in the 21st century. But Esther was really fulfilling obedience in this situation where Saul couldn't. Esther sought permission to complete what Saul never could do to completely devote to destruction the wicked Amalekite descendants. Esther was again used by God, and here it was for divine judgment. Now in this request, utter destruction and humiliation came upon the enemies of the Jews and the, and God, and the God who had chosen them and sat them apart. That sounds bad. I didn't mean to say that God was humiliated in that. No, God, God and the Jews uh, brought utter destruction and humiliation upon their enemies. Now on the second day, another 300 men were killed in the city of Susa, and none of their wealth or belongings were plundered. Now this 13th day of Adar, in many ways, demonstrated the principles of this holy war, the divine judgment of God's enemies and the destruction of them. God had given them great success, or had given great success to the Jews, and all was destroyed. Now you might be thinking, wow, this is a violent and pretty horrible passage to work through. But it's also a great reminder of what we deserve for our wickedness. We deserve to be destroyed like the Amalekites and those who hated the Jews because of our own wicked sins. But God, in His great mercy and grace, has given freedom from this kind of destruction and death. And because of this, we will look now to how Calvary too shares in the principles of this holy war. When we look to Calvary where Jesus bled and died, we don't see Him winning there. We see him dying on the cross at the hands of wicked men. We see him experiencing great violence and anguish on the behalf of all sinners. In fact, Jesus looks to face the same kind of punishment that Haman did. Both were hung up on cursed places and were publicly humiliated. But unlike Haman, Jesus took the curse of sin that was due all people. And he experienced that for you and for me. But Haman really got what he deserved. Haman and his followers patterned the world and sinners who rebelled against God. Haman and his followers experienced the consequences of their rebellion against the Jews and ultimately against God himself through death and their destruction. They got what all sinners deserve. Now we might not think we deserve the same punishment as genocidal folks, but we're still sinful folks. But rather than being hung like Haman in guilt, Jesus was hung like Haman in our place that we might find forgiveness and eternal life in him through faith and in his death and resurrection. Now more importantly, and in an even greater way, or even greater contrast to Haman and the enemies of the Jews, although Jesus died like a sinner, he did not stay dead. God rose him from the dead, and in this, he conquered and defeated death. It had no hold on him, nor evil's desire to keep him there. These things had no hold on him. Colossians 2.15 says uh, that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. Jesus triumphed over the rulers and the authorities that tried to kill him. Not just the human authorities and powers, but also the supernatural ones. When these authorities thought they had triumphed over Christ, God raised Jesus from the dead. They had no hold on him. And today, 2,000 years later, we continue to proclaim this and look forward to when he will display this triumph again. Jesus utterly defeated his enemies, like the Jews on the 13th day of the dark. Now, as I said before, one of the things that defines holy war is that there is no plunder. 
And in the case of Jesus, there's nothing of Satan's that's worth plundering. But Jesus is also not in need of anything. Because, well, everything belongs to him already. You know, he doesn't need anything. So instead of taking things, Jesus buys things back with his life and redeems them. He returns things back to as they were intended. Jesus can redeem all people and things that were once devoted to wickedness. And that includes us before we were willing to submit in obedience to him and experience his transforming power in our life. The only thing that we can do to wickedness is try and destroy it. But Jesus can actually redeem it and bring it back to what it once was. And so Jesus doesn't plunder, but he redeems. Now Jesus' resurrection disgraced all that opposed him. All his enemies were utterly put to shame. Jesus triumphed. He had total victory over his enemies as he took on the divine judgment that was due all sinners. And he, in a greater way compared to Esther, in obedience carried out God's divine judgment on wickedness by taking it upon himself. Jesus took the divine judgment that all mankind deserves in obedience. And then he died for it. But miraculously, through the power of God, rose from the dead. The grave could not hold him, and Jesus triumphed over this death and all those who had tried to kill him. But not only does Jesus triumph, but he also helps us to triumph over sin, death, darkness, and evil. Like God helped the Jews triumph, Jesus helps us triumph. The Christian life has the believer locked in a deadly spiritual battle. Ephesians 6.12 tells us, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Now, we may be caught in a battle, but we don't fight because someone else failed to win. Esther and the Jews had to fight because of Saul's failure. But now we can fight because of Christ's victory. As a follower of Christ, we can fight alongside the one who has already won. I used to play a lot of basketball when I was in junior and senior high, and I really enjoyed the game and enjoyed playing on some pretty good teams. Now, one of the things I remember being really, or that was really empowering for us as we played basketball was when we got to play for a coach who already had success. When we knew that our coach knew how to win, it was so much better to play for him. It was more exciting. The team was excited to battle it out that year, and we just felt ready to play and battle it out against all the other teams that year. Because we knew our coach had already won. Jesus has already won. Let that sink in. Let that encourage you to battle daily in your life for him. Let it encourage you that despite all your failure and sin, that Christ has already succeeded for you. It's very discouraging when you see sin rear its ugly head in your life. It's discouraging when you see your kids uh, struggling with sin, uh, even though they've made commitments to follow Christ and they seem to be off the course for the day. Just know that Jesus has already won. And, that, and, and with that knowledge, seek to fight confidently today in the battle against your sinful desires that seek to kill and destroy you, just as they sought to kill the Jews and just as evil sought to kill Christ. Be ready to fight against those in your day to day life and know that Jesus has already won for you, that he is fighting alongside with you, like God fought alongside the Jews. Now this battle started way back in the very beginning. Genesis 3.15 says, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. After God had spoke to the serpent in the garden of Eden, he cursed him and spoke of this constant battle between those who followed the same evil as the serpent and those who were God's people. That battle continues on and has taken many forms over the centuries. But one thing we can take confidence in is that God allows us to have victory in this battle through Jesus Christ. As Romans 16.20 says, and this is probably everyone's favorite camp song, 
the God of peace will soon proceed under your feet. We can know that through Jesus, there is certain victory. Now what a beautiful truth to rest in. What a beautiful way to be comforted despite knowing that there's a war at hand. Jesus wins, and then there is rest. Now in the last few uh, verses of our passage this morning, there was great rest for the Jews after this victory, probably even for the Persians themselves. There was great rest, even the fact that this day was done. I'm sure there was mourning for many Persians, but this was also finally a time of rest. After eight months of anticipating war, there was great rest for the Jews from their enemies. They no longer had to worry about this awful decree that hung over their heads. They were now free from that and could celebrate. Now, I'm not going to get too much into the significance of this rest and celebration. I'll let Tim explain that next week in his sermon. But one thing this rest should point us to is the future rest. It should point us towards the future rest. And like the Jews on the 13th day of Adar, we are still in the battle against the evil and spiritual darkness of this world. But we anticipate a rest from it someday. That is greater than any rest we could have experienced in our own lifetime. We look and forward and anticipate this rest that would be better than any day of rest that we could have in our lifetime now. Sin will no longer be messing up our lives, causing all sorts of commotions and trials. Right? We will be able to enter a rest that God has provided for those who put their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. And when we rest and desire to rest, it should make us think of eternity. But for now, like the Jews had to, and like Christ fought that on that day at Calvary, we too now fight in this battle continually the rest of our lives until Jesus comes again and displays his triumph. And so until that day comes, we anticipate with great joy and longing the rest that is to come through Jesus our Lord, the one who triumphs. So let's pray. Thank you for that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you um, for how it teaches us and it encourages us. And even when we can come to passages like this, it just seems so hard to understand why so much bloodshed is right there in one chapter and why you give so much success just to this group of people, Lord. It's, it's because it's in line with who you are. And it points us to really what we deserve. It points us to the fact that we deserve that same judgment that the, the, the enemies of the Jews face, Lord. And so may we turn to you with thankfulness and gratefulness, Lord, uh, that, uh, I mean, you've given your son, Jesus Christ, to take that, that, that punishment that we deserve for our wickedness. Father, we are so grateful um, that you've given us freedom from that through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray for those who haven't experienced that, that they might come to know what that freedom and forgiveness is through Jesus. That they might see how he fought for, for the world and on that day of Calvary uh, to forgive sins, to take the punishment that we all deserve. And, Lord, uh, may that um, just overflow into the way we battle out the rest of our lives, knowing that Christ has won, knowing that Jesus has won, that he has been risen from the dead, Lord, and that he reigns at your right hand, Lord. May we know that he has won and that he will come and display that victory again. And so, Lord, may we just anticipate with great hope that day and the rest that will come with it. A day where sin will no longer be ruling in our hearts, but, Lord, uh, you, will, you will be the king of our hearts. And so, Lord, may we just look forward to that day where we may experience that. And so, Father, I pray that you would just lead us into uh, this uh, week with that understanding and as we uh, come to you now and worship through song, may you be blessed in our response to that. Uh, in your name we pray. Amen. to the message, if you'd like to uh, join me in the, uh, if you want to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, verses 5 through 13. 1 John 5, 
and 5 through 13. <clears throat> who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater, because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Please stand if you are able.
morning we have uh, some uh, special guests with us here. Rick and Hannah Olney are uh, joining us for this morning. And so they had asked if they could just give a little bit of an update as they aren't around here a whole lot. They're in BC and all. Um, so we'll turn things over to them for the next few minutes and they'll just let us know what's new in their life these days. Well, good morning, everyone. It's really good to be here. Uh, I think it's been about, it's been over, over two years since I've been back here, so it's really good to be back. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know us, um, I'm Rick, this is my wife, uh, Hana. Um, I'm Bill and Claudia's son, you know Bill and Claudia, you know Jonathan there, at sound booth. Um, but uh, yeah, so we are um, with Liquid Bible Translators of Canada. And so we're currently assigned um, to teach at the Canada Institute of Linguistics. So what is linguistics, you may ask? Well, <laughs> and linguistics isn't about knowing lots of languages. That's being a polyglot. Uh, <laughs> linguistics is the study of how languages work. Um, so we help to train, uh, train people in linguistics, um, which is a key aspect of Bible translation. Um, in order to do a good, a good translation, you need to know about the language, know how the language works. Um, you need to know what sounds there are in the language. Uh, in many cases, um, the languages that we work with uh, in Wycliffe, uh, they're unwritten, undocumented languages, uh, and they're minority languages, so spoken, they're not the majority language of the country or whatever, um, they're minority languages. Uh, so people need to know how to write an unwritten language. Um, and to create a writing system for an unwritten language. Uh, so that's what, we, that's what we do at CanIO. Um, and it's, it's vital work um, in uh, helping uh, prepare people for Bible translation. So uh, what have we been up to? Well, uh, due to the current pandemic, <laughs> um, so we, we've still been teaching, um, but uh, this, our, this last summer, um, we, at Canaia, we had our first fully online summer semester, which was a brand new experience for everyone. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was difficult. Um, uh, technology sometimes didn't work very well. Uh, not just our technology, but like internet didn't work sometimes very well. Or, you know, those types of things. Um, but it was, it was really good. We both enjoyed our semester. Um, and because it was online, we had students attending that probably wouldn't have been able to attend otherwise. Um, and we have students uh, around the world, so we have students in every time zone in North America. Um, plus we had one student in China, a student in Ethiopia, a student in Thailand, a student in Singapore, and a student in Argentina. So, um, yeah, so working with people from all sorts of different time zones uh, was interesting. Um, <laughs> So the person who in South, oh, there was someone in South Korea as well, right? So for, for him, class started at midnight. <laughs> and he was in the three classes, so he had class from like midnight till three o'clock in the morning or whatever. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was interesting. Um, but yeah, and most of these students um, are training uh, to be involved in Bible translation um, around the world. Uh, and so actually, in fact, since we, uh, started teaching at Canaia, which was a number of years ago, um, at least uh, a, a pro probably approximately 30 of our students are actually um, now uh, working in languages around the world um, in, in various aspects of Bible translation. So that's really exciting for us uh, to be able to see um, some of the fruits of our labor, uh, even though yeah, we are not able to go yet ourselves. Um, and yeah, that brings me on to our next, my next thing. Um, so, uh, as many of you know, um, our assignment at, at the Canada Institute of Linguistics is just a temporary assignment until um, we're able to go to um, another country around the world. Um, Hana, who is from the beautiful state of Vermont, um, is, should be able to apply for uh, her Canadian citizenship this fall, um, and then we'll see how long bureaucracy takes to put the paperwork to. Um, anywhere between six months and a year, but we're not sure with how, that, how the pandemic will affect that either. Um, so, yeah, so we'll still be at uh, the Canada Institute of Linguistics for the next um, year, approximately. Um, and then hopefully we plan 
to serve in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, still our current plan, um, where I did an internship a number of years ago. Um, so, and, and it's, it's been exciting to hear um, from people there uh, the work that's going on, the translation work, despite their current difficulties. Um, it, Congo is an unstable country, um, and especially the eastern region where we hope to go. Uh, since January, the UN has estimated that there are 600,000 new displaced people um, it, internally in the country, uh, just due to the fact that there are rebel groups that roam freely throughout um, and attack villages and um, just cause people to, yeah, have to leave their homes. And um, so around Bunya, the, the city that where I was, um, there's now huge um, you know, displaced people camps uh, that have popped up. Um, but despite this, um, and the ongoing uh, pandemic, which affects them a lot worse than it affects us, because um, with border closures, they don't have uh, as much food, because they have a lot of stuff imported from Uganda, they don't have that. Um, and also, um, people not being able to work, um, they can't eat necessarily, so it's really difficult. But Bible translation still continues, um, and um, we're excited to hear um, about the, uh, the, the work that's continuing to happen. Uh, and they're still able to meet um, via the internet, via um, Zoom, as some of you know Zoom now, which I didn't know existed before <laughs> March. <laughs> but now it's everywhere. Um, so yeah, so we look, uh, we look forward to the day when we'll be able to um, yeah, go to Congo and work with um, these people who have persevered um, to, uh, to translate God's word um, through war and disease and all these things um, so that, uh, and so that they're, all the people uh, of Congo might have hope. Um, so thank you for your uh, continued support and prayers as we seek to be faithful to God uh, and follow his leading. And thank you for praying for us and for our students as well as um, the people we hope to work with one day. And yeah, we're glad you've been able to visit. And actually this was our first live in-person service since March. March. Because, yeah, our church has, well, we still have some, they, they do live services, but they're limited to 50 people, and yeah, so we haven't attended yet, but yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been good to be in a real ser service with real people. <laughs> Thank you. Rick and Hannah, it's good to have you here, even if it's just for a, a few minutes on one Sunday. It's good to, good to hear what's what's happening and how things are progressing, and definitely uh, some prayer items there that uh, things can go smoothly once the paperwork is in. Bureaucracy-wise, there's lots of control, but definitely good things to be praying about. Um, a few of an, a few announcements here as we, we wrap things up this morning, and then we'll have a, a prayer time we'll, we'll officially um, end the morning service. Uh, just a few things to be aware of. First of all, um, service times going forward will be at 9 and 11, except for next week, which is an outdoor service at 10.30. So we like to keep, we like to keep you on your toes. Uh, but when we do the two-service format, which will be the, the norm uh, for the foreseeable future, the services will be at 9 and 11, um, but next week is at 10.30. So with the outdoor service next week, make sure you bring a, bring a chair along, something to sit on. Um, we'll likely be meeting in the same place, just e east of the church, um, and thankfully we can do that all together. We're definitely looking forward to that. It was really good last time we were able to do that, um, so just be aware of that. And uh, the service starts at 10.30, but if you can come a little bit early so we can get everybody seated and stuff and start halfway close on time, that'd be great, but definitely looking forward to that. Um, there's a, a serving opportunity here in the church. Um, we're, we're looking for some people who may be interested in, in running the soundboard, a few more sound techs. Um, and so if that's something you're interested in or you have questions about, you're curious about, talk to Jennifer Friesen um, on the, the worship committee and uh, we, can, we can get you lined up. And if you don't know a thing about the soundboard, but you've always wondered, talk to, talk to her as well. And I'm sure we can, we can provide some training in that as well. Um, but just a need that we have there if that's something that you're interested in. One last thing to highlight here before we go to uh, our prayer time is 
Um, as Olin mentioned last week, um, even though in the bulletin it says he's away this week, he will not be away. He'll be here this week. So um, just so everybody is, is aware of that. Um, so let's take some time. Um, we're going to highlight a few prayer items from the bulletin, spend some time praying for them, and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap things up for this morning. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for this morning. Um, thank you for... Thank you just for a good service that uh, we've been able to have here together again. Uh, thank you for the privilege we have of meeting in person um, and for those who, who are able to join us here in person. Lord, thank you for that. For those who may be listening in the parking lot this morning, Lord, thank you for, for them as well. And for those who are a normal part of our congregation who for different reasons are here uh, with us in person or in the parking lot this morning, Lord, we do thank you for them um, as well. Lord, thank you for the privilege we have of worshiping together. Lord, help us not to take that for granted in this last season of, of our lives these last number of months we, we've just uh, I think been given the opportunity to realize how um, how special it is to be able to meet together and, and even if this feels different than um, what it did pre-March um, Lord thank you just for the opportunity we have to, to worship in this way together um, Lord we, we think of the, the different uh, prayer requests that are always highlighted in the bulletin Lord thank you for the opportunity we have to pray through these things um, this morning but also um, I trust through, through the week and as these things come to mind as well. Um, Lord, we're grateful for our church families this week, Ben and Lena Fair and Emily and Andrew and, and Tyra Peters as well. Lord, thank you for um, the fact that these, these families are a part of our church and for the, the role that they play and the ways that they're involved. Lord, thank you for the, um, yeah, just, just for bringing them here. And Lord, we pray as they face the week ahead, whatever that looks like. Lord, that you'll, you'll give them the grace that they need to, to get through each day, and you'll encourage them this week, and just remind them of your, your love for them, um, and just the truth of your word in their time spending it this week as well. Um, Lord, thank you for the, um, the Sunday morning services, as I've said, the chance we have to meet together. Um, Lord, I pray as we continue to do that in, in a different format, Lord, that you'll uh, just give us creativity in that, but also just remind us of, of why we're here um, to worship you. And just give us the, um, the ability to do that well. And Lord, we think of the missionary family this week. Uh, Thomas and Nicole Oney, thank you for their work in, um, in northern Manitoba. Um, I pray that you'll um, encourage them this week. Uh, just give them the strength they need to do whatever ministry you've got lined up for them this week. And uh, just, yeah, just give them a good week up there as well. Um, Lord, we do th pray as well for those who are um, involved in, in planning for the fall, different ministries, Sunday school, Awana, youth, all that. Um, Lord, we pray that um, you'll just give them the ability to uh, just be creative in how they, they plan for that, that they can keep the, the purpose of those ministries in mind as they, they put those plans together. And um, Lord, that we can continue to uh, to serve and minister um, as best we can, and that we'll just have the, the wisdom we need to, to do that as well. Uh, but thank you for this morning. Thank you for the, the opportunity to gather. And as we, we go from here now and uh, head over to have some time of fellowship and head into our weeks, or that we can um, just do so being equipped um, with some truths from your word uh, and just be with us as we go from here as well. Praise in your name. Amen. The benediction this morning is going to be from the book of Jude. It's a well-known uh, benediction, but a good way to end off the service. Um, Jude, verses 24 and 25, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this week, and uh, trust you have a good week.